Oh, well, I am very excited about this message to share with you guys tonight because what I, what I want to talk about tonight is something that I don't think it gets talked about enough in Christian circles, and that is the three earths. That gets your attention. The three earths. We need to talk about the three earths because in God's plan for redeeming mankind, there are three separate earths involved. And remember what the old saying is, if you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. So as we study history and God's unfolding plan for it, we not only learn what went on before, we learn what's going on now, how it compares with what went on before, and what's going to go on next, and how what's going on now compares with that as well. This is such a wonderful idea to talk about it from this perspective of the three Earths. So what am I talking about, the three Earths? Well, everybody will agree that God in his word tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That is one of the most profound statements you can utter as a human being living in the 21st century in the United States of America. If you can utter that statement with full conviction that you're speaking the truth, what you're doing is your, your testifying of your belief that God started everything. That, this, that everything that we see, everything that we know is not the, the result of some random chance, mindless manifestation of nothing into something that took billions of years to occur. When you say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you are separating yourself from 95% of the people living on this planet and probably 80% of the people attending church with you on Sunday morning. When God created the heavens and the earth, this is how powerful God is. God is the only one who has ever created something fully mature. When he created the heavens and the earth, he created them fully mature. When he created man, he didn't make Adam a baby. He made him a man. When he created the animals, they were mature animals. They were male and female, ready to reproduce, each after their own kind. When he created trees on the ground, they were fully matured trees with fruit in them. Nobody had to wait a billion years or 400 million years or 700 million years for this primordial ooze to somehow morph into a fish so it could morph into a bird. So, no. God created everything the way he wanted it, when he wanted it. That's what we learn from Genesis 1. And he created it about 6,000 years ago. Not 65 million years. And believe me, I could do a weekend seminar on show giving proof of that statement that the earth is probably no more than 6,000 years old. There's, there's so much evidence, it's Freaky Friday that Christians don't know about this. There's so much evidence that we can go into, and I'll go into a little bit of it, but not much. So he created the first earth about 6,000 years ago. Now why do I say the first? Aren't we living on the same earth? Well, we're living on the same land. We still have the same sun and the same moon. But the earth that we're living in is very, very different 
than the earth was before the flood. In fact, one of the differences is the, bear, the uh, atmospheric pressure is way different now than it was then. You know what it was then? It was 50% more dense before the flood than it is now. Why is that important? Well, not only is it important to know that it was 50% denser, if you will, more pressure then, but why was it? Because when God created it, he created the earth to be surrounded by what the scripture calls firmament. And the firmament was a water vapor barrier around the earth. There was no rain. There were no polar ice caps. There was no extreme heat. There was no radiation penetrating your pores of your skin from the sun because you were protected from it. There was no UV rays to worry about and put your sunscreen on. It was a beautiful, warm place. It was, in fact, much like a greenhouse. And everything grew green and wonderful. And nobody killed anybody. The animals didn't kill each other to eat. And man didn't kill animals to eat before the flood. Did you know that? So animals could live who knows how long. Adam lived 920 years. People say, well, how could the earth be populated just from two people? Well, give them 920 years. Because about 25 years after Adam and Eve were created, their first children started having babies. Now, any math majors in the room? Figure out in one generation, our generation, 40 years, how many people could come from two. Be fruitful and multiply, God said. And they multiplied, didn't they? So Adam died at 920 years. By the time he died, can we even imagine how many people were on the earth in 920 years? I didn't do the numbers. I should have done the numbers. That would have been fun to do. So there was no killing. There was no meat eating. There were no carp, carnivorous animals eating each other. And the largest dinosaur eggs we found in the fossil record about as big as a football. And yet dinosaurs, some of them, weighed 100,000 pounds. Do you know they are all vegetarians? None of them ate meat. How did they grow to be 100,000 pounds on vegetables? Yikes. It can be done. I guess it can be done because it was done. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? There was no rain. The, the long life was due to at the atmospheric condition because the earth was being, was being protected by the sun, from the sun. Listen, in Genesis 1.30, it says this. Uh, verse 29. Well, verse 28, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful, and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over all the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. You are in charge of them. Maintain them. Reign over them. You're not going to eat them. Well, how do you know that you did, they didn't eat them, Mike? Verse 29, then God said, look, I have given you, mankind, every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals. The birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and everything that has life is vegetarian. It's in your Bible. 
Well, all of those conditions support long life, support long, healthy life. There was no cancer. There was no alcohol. There was no cigarettes. There were no car accidents. There were no wars. You didn't have to be afraid of lions and tigers and bears because they didn't want to harm you. And all of those little details I just get, they, they support this concept of what we're finding in the fossil records, uh, mosquito hawks or dragonflies with 32 inch wingspans. We don't have them anymore. Where'd they go? Where did these dinosaurs go? Have you ever wondered where did they go? Well, they're in the fossil record. You can go find them. You can go, there's millions of fossils that have been classified. And you know, one of the strange things they found in the fossil record is they found um, dinosaur remains, if you will, right next to the footprints of men buried in the same level of rock strata. They died at the same time, and they died probably reasonably close to each other, not next to each other, but, well, how did they die? They died in the flood, my friends. In, uh, in Menis, uh, Genesis 2, 5 and 6, he says this. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain to cultivate, and there were no people to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead of rain, springs of water came up from underneath the ground and watered all the land. They had super soakers in the ground that watered everything. They didn't have to water to get green grass. So Adam lived, Adam and Eve and his descendants lived in that environment for nine, he lived for 920 years. Now why is that important? Because as we know what happened to that environment, to that first earth, what happened to it? It got covered with water. But wait a minute, it hadn't rained. How did it get covered with water? Well, let's read it and find out. We'll turn over to Genesis 7 and begin in verse 11. When Noah was 600 years old, listen to this, when Noah was 600 years old, now he, so what does that tell us about him and Adam? He was 300 years younger than Adam. He was a descendant of Adam. So he knew, probably knew Adam, a good chance that he knew Adam. He was in his family line. When he was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, God's being specific here, all the underground waters erupted from the earth and water fell in torrents from the sky. Wait a minute, there was no rain. Where did the water come from that fell from the sky? It came from that liquid bubble that God had surrounded the earth with to make it a perfect little greenhouse. So not only did that firmament, if you want to call it that, there's other names for it, break apart and fall down, but from the, underneath the earth, those springs of water that were watering the earth broke, erupted out of the earth. So we had volcanic action, plate shifting, and a deluge. The very day Noah had gone into the boat with his wife and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, with them in the boat were pairs of every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, along with birds of every kind. 
Two by two they came into the boat representing every living thing that breathes. A male and a female of each kind entered just as God had told Noah it would happen. Then the Lord closed the door. Now, we don't want to skip over this story, the details of this story. Notice what it says here. It's one of the reasons why I like this particular translation. It is a thought-for-thought -thought translation, not a word-for-word -word translation. So, these guys have researched the original language and, and said not only what did they say, what words did they use, but with those words, what, were they, what thoughts were they trying to convey that will make sense to us now where the original languages wouldn't make sense to us. If you've ever read the King James version of the Bible, it's very hard to read and very hard to understand. Two by two, the animals came into the boat. Noah didn't go and get them and round them up. They came. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, animals just came to the boat. How did they do that? God told him to get in the boat. Do you know there's a bird in Alaska that flies to Hawaii across the ocean? He doesn't stop. He doesn't eat. If he stops to eat, he drowns. He doesn't stop. He doesn't eat. He flies, some scholars have said, he flies nonstop for 82 hours this is a bird that weighs three or four ounces. What does he use for fuel? God designed him to make that flight. That's what he used for fuel. And I can go into it, but I don't want to belabor the point here. So God told them or directed them to go there. A male and a female. And notice, and when they had entered the ark, God closed the door. Why? Can you imagine how big that door was? The ark was 600 and something feet long and four stories high. For 40 days, listen, the floodwaters grew deeper, covering the ground and lifting the boat ever higher above the earth. As the waters rose higher and higher above the ground, the boat floated safely on the surface. Finally, the water covered even the highest mountains of the earth, rising more than 22 feet above the highest place. That's pretty specific. So whatever was the highest mountain at that time, we don't know what it was, the water rose 22 feet above the highest mountain. Why 22 feet? Because if you were standing on top of that mountain, <laughs> you're going to drown. All the living things on the earth died. Birds, domestic animals, wild animals, small animals that run along the ground, and all the people. Everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. God wiped out every living thing on the earth. People, livestock, small animals, and birds in the sky, all were destroyed, and the only ones that survived were Noah, and his, those who were with him on the boat, and the floodwaters covered the earth for 150 days. Real quick, what is that, five months? Five months. We're making sure everybody's dead. Everybody's gone. So then we jump over to uh, the receding part of the flood in verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 13. Now Noah was 601 years old. On the first day of the new year, ten and a half months after the flood began, the flood waters had dried up from the earth, almost dried up from the earth. And so li Noah lifted back the covering of the boat and saw that the surface of the ground was drying. Two more months went by, and at last the earth was dry. Then God said to Noah, leave the boat, all of you, you and your wife, your sons and their wives, release all the animals, the birds, the livestock, so they can be fruitful and multiply throughout the earth again. Now, remember, if there was no rain before this, 
There was no rainbow. You think God just decided, oh, I know what I'll do. You know these rainbows that we have every time it rains? I'll make that my symbol. No, there, weren't, there hadn't been any rainbows because there hadn't been any rain. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and there he sacrificed as burnt offerings the animals and birds that had been approved for that purpose. And the Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race. Even though everything they think or imagine is bent towards evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. There's no global warming. There's no climate crisis. As long as the earth remains, there will be... What do you mean, as long as it remains? Is that possible that it's not going to remain? He said as long as it remains. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, all the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, listen, all the small animals that scurry along the ground and all the fish in the sea will look at you with fear. They didn't look at you with fear before the flood. Now they're going to look at you with fear. They're going to be afraid of you. Lions, tigers, bears, elephants, giraffes, snakes, rattlesnakes are scared of you. Why? For I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for food just as I have given you grain and vegetables. He gave them grain and vegetables before the flood. So he's reminding Noah, you used to eat grain and vegetables. Now the menu has changed. If you want to answer the question, where's the beef? There it is. Go get it. But you must never eat any meat that still has the life blood in it. Now listen to this next part. And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. Think capital punishment upsets God? No, it does not upset God. If a wild animal kills a person, that animal must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Now, go be fruitful, multiply, and repopulate the earth. That's the second earth. So, what are the results of the flood on the family of man? Listen to this. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. How many generations of grandchildren did he see before he died? 350 years after the flood he, he lived. You know how long his oldest son lived? 600 years. After the flood, the oldest son lived 300 years less than his dad. After the flood. Why? Because they weren't living on the same earth. They didn't have the protection from the UV rays. They didn't have the protection from the radiation of the sun. They didn't even have protection from the animals. I'm sure this is where disease came from, dying, rotting animals. 
dying, rotting humans, perhaps. So Noah lived 950 years. His son lived 600 years. Abraham, who's in Noah's line, lived 175 years. Abraham's son, Jacob, who was renamed Israel, lived 147 years. Joseph, his youngest son, lived 110 years. Noah lived 950. What about now? How, do, how long do men on the earth live? Are you ready for this? The average life expectancy currently for United States of American males is 73 years. So some of us in this room have dodged a bullet. 16% of healthy American men never see the age of 90. Only 16%, pardon me, only 16% ever see the age of 90. Why? Because this earth is the second earth and it was, it's not like the first earth. We have murder, we have wars, we have disease. We have animals trying to kill us and we're trying to kill the animals. I killed one today. Just trying to eke out a living. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The animals are in competition for our food. The animals want to eat what we eat. And you know what people do? They feed them. How many times do you go in a federal, a national or a state park and they say, please do not feed the animals. You don't need to feed them. They feed themselves quite well. Don't teach them how to eat out of your hand. They're afraid of you. So now you're going to teach them to eat out of your hand, and the next guy that's going to come along is going to come along with his little bow and arrow or his BB gun and blow his brains out. Because now he trusts man. He's been taught to trust man. But men are not trustworthy, are they? Some men can't be trusted with your sneakers at school. So we're exposed to the harsh conditions in this new second earth. How long is that going to go on? You mean there's a third one? I said there was three when I started. I said there's three. So we're sitting here saying, I believe God created in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, what else do you believe about God's story? Where did you find out that he created the heavens and the earth in the beginning? You found it out in this book. Well, the flood is in this book as well. The ages of the patriarchs are, is in this book as well. You can track back on the ancestors' genealogy to find out that Noah was born just around, well, before Adam died. And you can follow the, the, uh, the list of nations that came from Adam, from Noah after the flood through his three sons and where they were dispersed on the earth. You can read about that in the Bible. And then you can read even furthermore in chapter 11, I believe, of Genesis, you can read about the Tower of Babel and why did God separate the people by their languages at the Tower of Babel? Because A, they were not interested in God. They were wicked, evil, untrustworthy, rebellious, prideful, arrogant, violent, dangerous people. And they were all speaking the same language, just like 2024, my friends. Across the globe, they're all speaking the same language. And what are they saying? They're saying, we don't need God. God didn't create the heavens and the earth. There's no such thing as God. You people ought to get with the program, man. Give that God thing up. This is as good as it gets. We're going to rule the earth. We're going to take charge of everybody and everything because we have the power to do it and nobody Nobody can resist our authority to do it. 
and we don't care what you think about it. We're going to do it. Look all over this earth and see that happening. We don't want to hear from you conservative Christians. Why do you think they hate Donald Trump? And anybody that thinks like him and wants to make America great again. Because they want world domination. They want every knee to bow to them. What did Satan say to Jesus in the temptation? I can give you all of this. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Rich, powerful, political people all over the earth are saying the same thing because they bought the same lie. I can give you everything. Just do what I tell you to do. God, what's this God thing about? Oh, you people are so antiquated. Get with the program. We're living in the age of AI. <laughs> yeah, and the life expectancy of the average American male is 73 years. That's not a real great accomplishment, if you ask me. Listen to Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 1, out of the stump of David's family, that's King David, will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. One breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like a garment. And in that day, now who's he talking about? Is he talking about Jesus? Hello? He's talking about Jesus. And in that day, when he does that, when the wicked are destroyed, the wolf and the lamb will live together peacefully. Think about that. Oh, the lamb's not going to be afraid of the wolf. The leopard will rot, lie down with the baby goat. The goat won't be afraid that the leopard's going to eat him. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze where the bear is grazing. What? The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a, like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put his hand in the nest of deadly, deadly snakes without fearing harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy ever again. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know God. He's talking about the third and final earth, my friends. What does Peter have to say about that? Peter says, this is chapter 3 of Peter's second letter, letter, verse 1. This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. This was written probably in the late 50s A.D., I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded us through the apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days on earth, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. We're living in that day. Mockers. Oh, you Christians. You pro-life people, come on. 
close the borders, open the pipeline. <laughs> yeah, right. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? You've been talking about it for centuries. From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. What? Nuh-uh. <laughs> Nuh-uh. I just told you it hasn't been the same. It got changed. When? About 4,500 years ago. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. I think things are winding down. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out of the water and surrounded it with water. What did he do? He surrounded the earth with water after he created it out of the water. The dry land came out of the water. He created it. The water, then the dry land. And he surrounded it with water, which caved in on it at the flood. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. This is, this is Peter writing 2,500 years after the flood. And by the same word of God, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. Well, <laughs> that doesn't sound good. They are being kept now until the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come, and it will come as unexpectedly as a thief. You don't expect the thief to come. You just go out there and get in your truck to go to the beach and you find out somebody has broken into it and taken all the change out of your little change cup that you used for coffee on the drive. You didn't expect it to happen. I guess he thought he needed it more than you did. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants all to repent, but the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. They're not just going to passively disappear like smoke on the wind. And the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to be judged. Verse 11. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, brothers and sisters, what holy, godly lives should you be living, looking forward to the day of God, and in fact hurrying it along? For on that day he will set the heavens on fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that Isaiah prophesied in chapter 11. Because he has promised it, it is, will be a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people around you. You will not lose this secure footing. Rather, you must continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us there, there's, your plan is unfolding. We have evidence of it. The pre-flood, the post-flood era that we're living in now, and the glorious day that's coming when you remake our heavens and our earth, and when there will be no more wickedness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more wars, no more accidents, no more illnesses, no more diseases. There will be peace and there will be joy because every human living on the earth will know God. Help us, Father, remember this and never, ever forget it. Mankind is the one that breaks the covenant with you. You don't break your covenant with us. You have told us what we must do to be spared the agony of a fate worse than death that, that is waiting for everyone who rejects the truth that Jesus Christ is God, that Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth, and Jesus Christ will ultimately destroy this earth and the elements surrounding it to create paradise where he will live with us throughout the endless eons of eternity. Help us, Lord, keep that in the forefront of our minds so that we can live like Peter said, holy, blameless lives in your sight. We humbly ask through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.